Let's go together to Esther, Esther chapter 8, the king as God's minister. And this is our part two. We began last week, last week at the high school. We looked at the first eight verses, the king as God's minister. The providence of God is an overwhelming truth. It's an overwhelming reality. I want to again remind us all of this definition of God's providence from the Heidelberg Catechism. Question 27, what dost thou mean by the providence of God? Answer, the almighty and everywhere present power of God, whereby, as it were, by his hand, he upholds and governs heaven, earth, and all creatures, so that herbs and grass rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, meat and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, yea, and all things come not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. So in our country right now, we have droughts, we have fires, and we have flooding. And God is provident over it all. Every aspect of our lives. Question 28, what advantage is it to us to know that God has created and by His providence does still uphold all things? What advantage is it to us? Answer, that we may be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and that in all things which may hereafter befall us, we place our firm trust in our faithful God and Father, that nothing shall separate us from His love, since all creatures are so in His hand, that without His will they cannot so much as move." I read this quote last week from Spurgeon on Providence, where he said, You want always to see through Providence, do you not? You never will, I assure you. Honor God by trusting Him. Don't wait till you understand, or do you, to, I'll, I'll wait till I understand like God understands. You won't get there. Because you're not God. I'm not God. So we're to trust Him. Trust and obey. 2,500 years ago in Persia, Esther, Mordecai, the king, all of the people, Jews and Gentiles, they came to see before their eyes the reality of Proverbs 21, verse 1. The king's heart is where, church? In the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. He is God. And if he is sovereign over a king, then he by all means is sovereign over a president who's elected. He is sovereign over a vice president. He's sovereign over a governor. He's sovereign over an attorney uh, general. He's sovereign over every aspect, over a mayor, over a city council member, over a superintendent in a school district. All of these individuals, whether they know it or not, are God's ministers for what purpose from Romans 13? To promote good and to punish evil. That's what government is commanded by God to do. Promote good, punish evil. To make the place a safe place to live. That is the job of a government. And as God's ministers, they will all, from Hitler on down, give account to God for what they did with the power sovereignly entrusted to them for a little breath of time. Esther chapter 8, we're going to start in verse 1. We're going to go through the end of the chapter this morning. The king as God's minister. Chapter 8, verse 1, on that day, King Ahasuerus gave Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. So the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. Now Esther spoke again to the king, fell down at his feet, and implored him with tears to counteract the evil of Haman the Agagite and the scheme which he had devised against the Jews. And the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, 
if it pleases the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seems right to the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, those four statements, let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha of the Agagite, which he wrote to annihilate the Jews who are in all the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that will come to my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, Indeed, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows because he tried to lay his hand on the Jews. You yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews as you please, in the king's name, and seal it with the king's signet ring. For whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. So the king's scribes were called at that time. In the third month, which is the month of Sivan, on the, 20th, on the 23rd day, and it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded to the Jews, the satraps, the governors, and the princes of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces in all, to every province in its own script, to every people in their own language, and to the Jews in their own script and language. And he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus, sealed it with the king's signet ring, and sent letters by couriers on horseback, riding on royal horses bred from swift steeds. By these letters, the king permitted the Jews who were in every city to gather together and protect their lives, to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the forces of any people or province that would assault them, both little children and women, and to plunder their possessions on one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province and published for all people so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. The couriers who rode on royal horses went out, hastened and pressed on by the king's command, and the decree was issued in Shushan the citadel. So Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white with a great crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. The Jews had light and gladness, joy and honor. And in every province and city, wherever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a holiday. Then many of the people of the land became Jews because fear of the Jews fell upon them. Father, we come to you again asking you for help, Lord, that we will have our eyes opened to your word and the truth here, that we will have our ears open to hear what the Spirit would say to the church, and that you will enable our wills to respond in obedience. As we will spend time together, Lord, at your table, we remember our King. We compare and contrast King Jesus, the great King, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, we compare and contrast Jesus with this wicked king, Ahasuerus, and we see how great you are, Lord Jesus. So draw us near to you today, in your presence, in the congregation with one another. For Jesus' sake, amen. Last week we began, we looked at the first three characteristics of the king as God's minister, and we're defining a good leader. And this is true whether you're a governor, whether you're a mayor, whether you're a pastor, whether you're a head of a household, you're a supervisor on your job, wherever you may be, you can look. I can look into the word of God and say, what makes a good leader? What makes a good leader? And we saw last week when we were at the high school, in the first two verses of Esther 8, we see a good leader promotes righteous people. They promote righteous people. And finally, King Ahasuerus, remember he promoted Haman, the wicked Haman, the despot, the nasty guy, the murderer. That's who he first gave the ring to. And we're seeing a change here when he promotes Mordecai, a righteous person. 
We saw, secondly, a good leader listens to righteous counsel. A good leader does not buck up, argue, or excuse bad behavior. They don't justify for their own personal ambition. They will listen to righteous counsel, and that's what Ahasuerus is finally beginning to do. Thirdly, we saw a good leader uses his or her power and position to protect the innocent and vulnerable. They use their position. They lead the way in protecting others. The king's plan was to let Mordecai and Esther. You write, Mordecai. You write your own edict, and may the best edict win. This is a way for the king to save face. He's not going to come before his kingdom and say, hey, everybody, you're following me. I'm the king. I'm sovereign. I'm sorry. I messed up. He's not going to do that. Okay? So he says, I've already signed and sealed this one, and it's been delivered. He, maybe he should get the patent of that song. And then he says, so go ahead. You write a new edict. I'll sign it. Seal it. You deliver that one, and may the best edict win. So let's finish this chapter together now. The fourth characteristic of a good leader as a good minister of God. Number four, a good leader encourages everyone to protect the innocent and vulnerable. It's not good enough that they are leading the way. They're going to create an environment where everyone encourages. They encourage an environment where everyone protects the innocent and the vulnerable. Perhaps some of you saw, it was several years ago, um, there was a video from surveillance in China, I believe. And it was of a street. It was a dark street. And there was a, a toddler that made its way across the street and was struck by a vehicle. And the toddler went down in the street. The vehicle fled the scene. And people walked by. And no one would help that toddler in the middle of the street. Cars went around, went this way, went that way. People walked by. And like in the, para the Good Samaritan, they just looked and walked by on the other side. Why? Probably because they didn't want to be blamed for, the, for what had happened. But any society that does not have the gospel, then women and children are left out to dry. They're taken advantage of. So a good leader not only leads the way in protecting women and children and honoring them in their, the roles that God has given for them, but they also create an environment and they encourage others to protect the innocent and the vulnerable, not to just leave them by the wayside. Now here we see in verses 9 through 14 that King Ahasuerus is making a declaration for just war. For just war. The king sets the stage for the wrong to be right by declaring just war. Now, Augustine is the one who developed the theory and the teaching of a just war. He gave basically four legs that this stands on. Number one, he said, just authority. Is the decision to go to war based on a legitimate political and legal process? So that's a question that as a nation, in our history, we have thought through. And some of you, many of you have served. We celebrate Independence Day tomorrow. Just. Is there a just authority? Number two, Augustine laid out, is there a just cause? Has a wrong been committed to which war is the appropriate response? Okay, so... Go back some months ago, the Yazidis were on the hillside, and what happened? What did the world do? They watched. We're walking away from, we're departing from what we've been known for, and that is, it's not okay to march a defenseless group of people, of elderly and men and women and children, out to a hillside so that they can starve to death on a mountain or be killed when they come down and ISIS is waiting for them. A just cause. Number three, a right intention. Is the response proportional to the cause? It, does it demand a response? And the response be 
war. Number four, last resort. Has every other means of righting the wrong been attempted sincerely so that no other option but war remains? Have we gone through sanctions? Have we gone through any means possible to get a wicked nation to do what's right? And they will not. Therefore, we are going to have to go to war to bring liberty to those who are innocent and vulnerable. Some of you saw the video footage that came out delivered by ISIS where they went into a village in northern Iraq in the region where we are praying for Irfan, who is ministering, and there they rounded everyone up in the village, and it broke my heart, and I wept as they came in with guns, and they're a defenseless village. They huddled all the men over here, and all the women and children over here, and then they began to take the women and children away. And the men stood there, helpless, could do nothing. They, were de they, they had nothing with which to defend themselves. So they watch their wives and they watch their children be taken away into sexual slavery, be plundered and pillaged, and they couldn't do anything. I just wept thinking, how, how would I feel standing there watching that happen to my family? Are you kidding me? My heart broke for them. So the king here, he calls in in verse 9. He calls in his scribes on the 23rd day of the third month. About two months have passed since the 13th day of the first month. And now it looks like there's no hope. It looks like the children of Israel, are they're going to die. The Holocaust in Persia, in Iran, modern day Iran, was coming their way. And it looked like there's no one that's going to, no one's going to be able to stop this. No one's going to be able to, to right what's wrong. But by the king's command, they wrote, the Bible says, everything Mordecai commanded. Now, if you look at this edict, if you see what was said, and, and you see it there in verse 11, a question comes up to say, is this appropriate for a Jew to write? Verse 11, by these letters, the king permitted the Jews who were in every city to gather together and protect their lives. I think we'd all be good with that. Like, yeah, that's good. They can join together and protect their lives. But then li listen to how Mordecai defines what does it mean to protect your lives. To destroy, kill, and annihilate all the forces of any people or province that would assault them. Well, who does that include, Mordecai? both little children and women, and to plunder their possessions. Is that appropriate for a Jew to be writing that Jews can protect themselves and go after the women and children of their enemies and take all their stuff? Well, the answer comes when you look back at chapter 3, verse 13, and you realize Mordecai's edict is a direct parallel it's a direct parallel to Haman's. Everything that Haman said, Mordecai must give an exact counterbalance. Okay? So throughout the kingdom, understand when he includes everything, he cannot leave his people def defenseless. So he gives them every permission that Haman wrote in the evil edict. He gives in a righteous edict to say, think about it, citizens of Persia. Before you go in obedience or in the commission of Haman's edict with the king's permission, before you go to war against Jews, they have every permission to come back at you. So before you arm up, you might want to stay home that day and your family will be left alive. You might decide to play Scrabble or, you know, clean out the barn, or do something that day. Don't go to war against the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because they have every right to do to you what Haman said you and you have been planning to do to them. Okay? So this is a pause. I remember the, the uh, what was it? It's a True Value hardware store. I'm checking out, you know, going through the little checkout. I remember that glass, the plastic glass. And there's a picture of a revolver. This establishment guarded by Smith & Wesson, three nights a week, you choose the night. You know? Like, whoa, better not come here. 
And it's, it's kind of comical, but that's, that's what Mordecai is doing. He's canceling the edict. So he has to include everything. Now, when Haman writes it, everyone in Persia that was of Haman's ilk, they were going to do it unjustly, just as Hitler did to the Israelis in Germany and Poland. They took their stuff. They put them in ghettos, and they hauled them away to incinerate them. Now, when this edict comes down for the children of Israel, we'll see how it plays out. They didn't want to do that. They were thankful for what God had given them. They were not greedy, just like Esther. Here you go. You have Haman's house. And she says, Mordecai, you can have it. I don't need it. She wasn't trying to get more stuff and get more land. She had God. He was enough. She could trust him. So the second edict, the edict of Mordecai, takes into account every aspect of Haman's prior edict. The king's command went to every person in the kingdom. The king's command went to every place in his kingdom. The king's command went in every language, every script in his kingdom. It, it went everywhere, including in the script of the Hebrews. The king's edict was delivered rapidly by the king's messengers in an expedited way. And the Bible says they were riding on royal horses bred from swift steeds. So in the words of the Detroit native Tim Allen, that's more power. <laughs> okay? It's more power. He said, don't take those, those horses. Those are the normal horses. We're going to get this done. All right, all, there's not a guy here that doesn't like, you know, here's your car, but look at what we did to the engine. Pop the hood, and we added this, and we did this, and it burns on the nitrous, and whoa, 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 listen to that sound. Okay, here's the king saying, go back to my shed. Get into my collection of the special horses, the real fast horses, and you put the riders on them, and when they roll into every town in every part of this province, people are going to know there's something about this message. So even here, we see the king Ahasuerus is beginning to roll his sleeves up and engage in defending the innocent and the vulnerable. And he's adding people to it. The king gave a royal decree that permitted, legalized, and royally endorsed self-defense. On the 13th day of the 12th month, which was the month of Adar. What day is that? That's the very same day that Haman's edict was issued. That for that day, this is the day Jews die. And here comes the next edict and say, this is the day the Jews can defend themselves. And imagine that, it's the same day. It's just war. Think about it. This control freak king, remember? He's the one that like, and you let them know at my party, if they don't want to drink, it's okay with me. Oh, thanks, king. Okay. I won't be offended. And get my wife and bring her in. Bring in Vashti. King, she said she's not coming. What? Depose her. Get rid of her. Because I make the orders around here. I make all the commands. Finally, this king is per permitting the subjects in his kingdom to stand up for what is right and to defend themselves. This is, he's showing signs of becoming a better king. Why? Because Mordecai and Esther are in his palace. As long as Haman was in there, he was in Haman's palm of the hand. Well, now Haman's dead. The birds are working on him at the eight-foot story gallow. And now Mordecai. Uh, we were walking on a trail up by Lake Annas uh, last week, and I just looked up at one tree. There was a storm that came through there, just knocked all these huge trees down. They call it a straight line wind, a storm that happened back in August in the Sleeping Bear Dunes up there. And I just remember looking at there's a few trees, you know, still left, and they're just way up. And I'm thinking, what would that look like to walk by and taller than that tree is Haman at the top of that thing? You know, ah, oh, birds all around, you know. What would that be like? Well, that happened. Here the Persian government is allowing people to depend on God, not the government. A good government gets out of the way. A bad government says, look to Uncle Sam. Look to the government and we'll meet your needs. That's a bad government. What is biblically the job of government? Promote evil or promote good, and I'm too modern on that one, promote what is good and punish evil. I'm just checking to see if you're listening, okay? 
That's God's sovereignty. Depend on God. But here the Persian government, 2,500 years ago, is permitting its citizens to defend themselves. That's a responsibility. Now, I'm going to give you a little sneak preview. I'm loving the Wednesday nights. And if you're, I'm, I'm going to say it again. Be here on Wednesday night at 630. This week, we're going to look at the life of D.L. Moody. And uh, I'm reading the, the life story, the autobiography of John G. Patton. He was uh, a missionary to the, the New Hebrides. Uh, Vanuatu, an island of cannibals, the first two cannibals that showed up. They clubbed them, and they cut them up, they boiled them, and they ate them. Okay, anybody want to go on the mission trip? Okay, John Patton, he said, I'll go. And his parents said, that's what we've been praying for. Your dad wanted to go in the ministry, couldn't go in the ministry, and we're good with it. Go in the ministry. We're thankful that God has answered our prayers. Now listen, because I found this interesting. How would you do if you're living in the middle of an, an island of cannibals, and, and they are just known for clubbing, cooking, and eating their victims, their enemies. I mean, it's just all the time happening everywhere. And here he's living. This is uh, something I found helpful on uh, self-defense, human responsibility, and God's sovereignty. This is what he wrote. He said, For I have ever most firmly believed and do believe that only when we use every lawful and possible means for the preservation of our life which is God's second greatest gift to man, life eternal through his son being the first, can we expect God to protect us? Or have we the right to plead his precious promises? Okay, so what is he saying? He's saying, do whatever you can do legally to protect yourself. When you've done that, then you have the right to say, and Lord, will you deliver us? Okay? These two things, God's sovereignty, human responsibility, going hand in hand. Now, it happened in uh, one account that he was on the island, and six or seven men, the word came to the missionary house that six or seven men were clubbed, they were hanging, and they were waiting to have a feast on them. And the word came to the missionary, John Patton, you're on the list. They're coming for you, and they're coming for his missionary team, the, the, the natives that had come to faith in Christ, and were now teaching in the different missionary stations around uh, the island. He said, they're coming for you. They're sick of your message of Jehovah. They, they, they would blame everything on him when sickness would come, when storms would come. They would say, it's your fault, and you're causing us to turn away from our gods. So everything that went you know, right, they didn't give him credit for everything that went wrong. They gave him the blame for. So here he is, and it says, Information had reached me that my teachers and I were also destined victims for this same feast. And sure enough, we espied a band of armed, armed men, the killers dispatched toward our premises. Instantaneously, I had the teachers and their wives and myself securely locked into the mission house. And, cut off from all human hope, we set ourselves to pray to our dear Lord Jesus, either himself to protect us or to take us to his glory. All through that morning and forenoon, we heard them tramp tramping around our house, whispering to each other and hovering near window and door. They knew that there were a double-barreled fowling piece and a revolver on the premises. Or, you know, John's gun safe. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. They knew that there were a double-barreled fowling piece and a revolver on the premises, though they had never seen me use them. And that may, under God, have held them back in dread. But the thought of using them did not enter our souls, even in that awful time. I had gone to save and not to destroy. It would be easier for me at any time to die than to kill one of them. Our safety lay in our appeal to that blessed Lord who had placed us there and to whom all power had been given in heaven and on earth. He that was with us was more than all that could be against us. This is strength. This is peace. To feel in entering on every day that all, it, all its duties and trials have been committed to the Lord Jesus, that come what may, he will use us for his own glory and for our real good. I think that that's a helpful explanation that he didn't just say, oh, let's just trust the Lord and go stand in the middle of the people who are coming for us and we'll just trust the Lord. No, he used wisdom. Let's get into the mission house. Let's lock the doors. He had a couple weapons. 
But that's not why he came. So he doesn't know whether well, the weapons, they didn't want to come in because there was weapons or God. He attributes it to God. But he had a human responsibility, but he also maintained a posture that was dependent on God. That's what we see unfolding in Esther chapter 8. Well, how did this transformation come about? All the horses coming out of the palace and the words, you know, what happened? What changed here? God is working on behalf of his people. 2 Chronicles 7.14 results in this kind of rejoicing. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then the Lord says, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. The children of Israel in this kingdom of Persia are seeing that come to fruition. God's going to rescue us. Something's going on in the palace. Haman's dead, and the king is listening to Mordecai and Esther. This is King Ahasuerus' answer to Haman's purge. Movies come out every now and then, the purge. One day you can do whatever you want to do. No, that, that's like Haman. There's nothing new. That's what Haman said. We're going to purge our land. On this day, kill all the Jews. Now there's a different leader, and it's Mordecai. And God is using him not to kill people, but to save people. You see, this is a way for King Ahasuerus to allow good to defend itself against evil. And this is as close to an apology as you're going to get from this guy. He's not going to stand up and say, my bad. I, miss, I messed up. So he says, Mordecai, write it. I'll sign it. Seal it. We'll send it out on the fast horses and may the best edict win. But you also see that Ahasuerus now is doing more than the bare minimum. He pressed the messengers, treat this announcement with great urgencies, get on the, uh, urgency, get on the fast horses, get this thing out there. People have got to hear that they can defend themselves. Let's contrast two kings. King Ahasuerus and King Jesus on the human condition. Ahasuerus, he would stand up before his kingdom and say, um, it was my fault, I signed it, and you're all going to die, sorry about that. But you can defend yourselves. King Jesus stands before all humanity and says, it wasn't my fault, it was your fault, you disobeyed. God said, eat of the tree, you'll die, and we've been to a lot of funerals. And one day, they will be at our funeral. God didn't lie. Satan lied. He's the father of lies. Jesus stands before all humanity and says, you deserve to die because you're rebellious. You're a sinner. You've rebelled against your king. You can't defend yourself against the holy God. You're in real trouble. So here's the divine plan. Jesus came, took to himself flesh, lived a sinless life, went to the cross and died himself, was buried and rose from death Easter morning, conquered death, hell, and the grave, and says, I've opened the way. I can pardon, forgive. I can add you to my family, but you must. There's one way. It's me. King Ahasuerus, he wasn't going to do that. He wasn't going to die for anybody. He wasn't going to go fight for anybody. He simply said, you can fight for yourselves. You have to fight because I messed up. I appointed the wrong people. I have ele elevated wicked people. So now Mordecai's, here it is, and you can defend yourselves. Jesus says, you can't, but I'll defend you, but you must come to me. You must trust in me. Ahasuerus said, well, you don't have to die. I'll let you defend yourself. Jesus says, I die for you, and I'll be your defense. God's offer for reconciliation is available to all who are living. And beloved, it is a most gracious offer. It's a most gen generous offer. If you reject God's offer of forgiveness and life, you have no one to blame but you. And for all eternity, you will know I rejected God's offer of salvation. And I said, that's all right. I'll do it my way. I'll sign on with Frank Sinatra. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of its way is death. If you reject God's generous, gracious offer, listen to me, 
You have no one to blame. My job is to preach the truth. Your responsibility is to respond in a way that glorifies God and is good for you, but it glorifies God. A great leader knows how to admit failures and take the blame that could rightly be laid on others. People like Haman, they take advantage of situations like this. They exploit situations for their own ambition, for their own personal gain their own personal gain. They will put other lives at risk so that they can have more, be more, have more uh, preeminence. People like Mordecai, they're willing to die so that others can be uh, honored and exalted and protected. A good leader as God's minister promotes righteous people, listens to righteous counsel, uses his or her power and position to protect the innocent and vulnerable, encourages everyone to protect the innocent and vulnerable. And fifthly, publicly honors faithfulness and integrity. That's what a good leader does. They make a big deal of those who are faithful, those who have integrity. Remember the man whom the king delights to honor? That was Mordecai. Now we see him honored, not just for a morning, but for life. He wasn't seeking either of these positions, but God elevated him. God raised him. Humble yourselves, therefore, in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. When you try to elevate yourself, God puts you down. Trust him and trust his timing. We see Mordecai going out from the presence of the king, verse 15. This isn't the way he went in. And he's a long way from wearing sackcloth and ashes now. Now he comes out and he's wearing the royal colors of Persia. Blue and white. Tomorrow people be wearing red, white, and blue. You know, get the band going. Some of you already got your red on today. Like, it's July 4th, you know, Independence Day. I think I got an American flag tie somewhere. That was when I was going to school as a kid. I'm not wearing that, okay? But, um... Red, white, and blue. Now he's wearing the, the royal colors of Persia. He's got purple on. And the king, now we don't see the king saying, um, I need some help. Can somebody help me? I don't know what to do. I need to honor Mordecai. Finally, the king is not a namby-pamby, wimpy leader. He's like, I have an idea. I like Mordecai. Get a robe, the colors of Persia, put it on him, and get the crown. No, not that crown, the big crown. Put it on his head, and here, put some purple on him, and let him go out. Now he's honoring integrity and faithfulness. Mordecai wasn't grabbing for that. He wasn't writing the king notes. How about me? It's my time now. Ooh, me? I've been here all the time. You know, you've looked over me. Now the king is engaged in this. He comes out. This parallels the banquet in chapter 1. The couches, the gold, blue, white, all the wealth. Now it's not on stuff. It's on a person. It's on Mordecai. Think about what people were doing in the kingdom. Like, what happened there? That guy was supposed to die. I heard he was supposed to die. Yeah, up there where Haman is. Hey, Haman. Oh, my bad. You're not waving anymore. Okay, up there where Haman was is, well, there's still some left of him. That's where Mordecai was supposed to be. Did you see what Mordecai's wearing? Did you see his duds? You see his outfit? Yeah, who's he wearing? Uh, a hedge you wears. Wow, that's amazing. What happened here? God's at work. That's the only answer. It's the only explanation. God is defending his people. So the Jews, wherever this went, had light and gladness, joy and honor. Imagine this. Think about this. They're in their towns. They're in all of the cities, in all of the provinces. Fathers, put yourself in this situation. You are facing imminent death. You know this is the day we die. That was the last time the king's horses came in. They said, wise, you'll die with your family on this day. Suddenly, here come the king's horses. It wasn't good the last time they brought the headlines. What are they bringing today? Oh, it's in your language. You can defend yourself on this day. Suddenly, 
Tom, your family's not going to die before your eyes. Eric, your family's not going to die before your eyes. You have a, a chance to do something. Rusty, your family's not going to die before your eyes. You put yourself into this situation. This isn't just a story. This is real. This is people coming for people's wives and children and them. They're going to kill them and you have no hope. And now here comes the fast horses and they're blowing up the smoke and the sand and they come in and it's the message from the king. You can defend yourself. Sitting right next to that other edict, word for word, you can go at them if they come at you. Whoa! God is awesome! What happened in Mordecai? And this is what happened in Tell Us, Give Us the News. And the word is going out. It's a party in all of Persia. Our God reigns. He's sovereign. He's provident. And it was dark. And now there's light. And we were sad. And now we're glad. And we were in sorrow. And now we have joy. And come on, I didn't want to eat for the next 11 months. But now let's have a feast because we're not going to die. That might be a good place to say amen. Yeah, it's pretty good. All right. Number six, a, a good leader secures an environment that protects and promotes the freedom of religion. We see this in verse 17. And in the, every province and city, wherever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a holiday. Then many of the people of the land became Jews because fear of the Jews fell upon them. Now remember something, the children of Israel, they're not at home. They're in a foreign land. You can't legislate conversion, okay? There's many kingdoms and countries. A couple weeks ago, we looked at Spurgeon. Scott shared the back and forth of, we will all be Catholic and all Protestants die. And the next one comes up, no, we'll all be Protestant and all the Catholics die. Okay? We come to America um, and, and Rhode Island is found. Founded. Roger Williams develops this. No, it's not going to be Maryland. We're not all, not going to be a state religion. It's not going to be all Baptist in Rhode Island. He was a Baptist. No, there's got to be, there has to be freedom because you cannot make, you cannot mandate Christianity. Oh, yes, we did. We baptized them when they were eight days old. You got them wet. You didn't make a conversion in the heart because only God can do that. So when you look at environments here, the king couldn't say, and now we will all be Jews. Now, some of the Jews, they may have converted. They may have faked it. They may have lied may have done so for a wrong reason. Nevertheless, God was working. The environment for religious liberty that promotes a place where citizens have the freedom to discuss, debate, and determine which religion is true, that's good leadership. Bad leadership silences, in the name of tolerance, silences those who live and preach the gospel. That's bad leadership. If you look around, look at the governments that are not built on a framework of scripture. Look at Cuba. Look at China. Look at North Korea. Look at Iraq. Look at these countries where there's no freedom of religion. You're born in this country, this is what you will be. India, returning to Hinduism. The recent ele uh, election falls on the same lines. Isaac Shah told us, they're Hindu president now. Vote for me. I'll make India great again. Taking it back to Hinduistic roots. Whatever land you have that isn't set up on a framework of scripture, it's always bad for women, and it's always bad for children. Only where the gospel goes do they stop strangling their wives when the husband dies because he needs a servant in the afterlife. When William Carey shows up in India and they're performing sati, which is burning the wives on the dead husband's pyre, and he pleads with them and he does everything he can to change the laws of the land till it's forbidden. And that's intact. Well, why did that happen? Not because of Hinduism. 
not because of Buddhism, not because of Islam, because of true Christianity, the gospel. The gospel brings light and life in a place, any place of darkness and death. The gospel goes there and lives. You know, what, you know what he says, John Patton? He says, for all of the atheists that reject Christianity and they say that it's a bunch of made-up lies, I want them to come and I want them to live with me. Live with me. And here's what they can do. They can go take their atheism, their God doesn't change and God isn't real and the Bible is nothing. Let them go live in the middle of the cannibals then. And then let them come and be taken care of a man named Abraham who was a converted cannibal who cared for him when he was sick and carried him when he sat down beside a palm tree to die because he was so sick as he was moving his house up from the bay. And he said, tell me then that this cannibal who's carrying me and ministering that the gospel makes no effect, you won't find an atheist there. You want to be an atheist? Go live out there where no gospel's been and tell me you believe that God doesn't make a difference. He says, as for me, I know it does. Because this cannibal who would have just as soon eat me is now taking care of me. What happened to him? Jesus Christ changed his life. I'm giving it all away. But that's okay, there'll be more for that Wednesday night coming up. The Jews celebrated in every part. The event that was intended for their extermination going to kill all the Jews. Well, what happens then? That means you kill the line of Messiah. This is a satanic holocaust. If we get rid of all the Jews, we get rid of a redeemer to come. Will God's promises fall down? The fear of God fell upon all the people of Persia because God's covenant promises did not fall to the ground. Even in a distant land, there was great joy. Remember the promise of God made to Abraham, Genesis 12, 1 and 2? The Lord to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Is God going to be true to his word or is that covenant going to fall down? When those fast horses came riding into your town in Persia, God's word is true. He's been faithful. He's been faithful. He promised Abraham we would be a blessing. He promised Abraham. And we have heard of Mordecai and we have heard of the fate of Haman. Exodus 15, 14 through 16. Remember the past deliverance from Egypt. Verse 14. The people will hear and be afraid. Sorrow will take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom will be dismayed. The mighty men of Moab trembling will take hold of them. All the inhabitants of Canaan will melt away. Fear and dread will fall on them. By the greatness of your arm, they will be as still as a stone. Till your people pass over, O, o Lord, till the people pass over whom you have purchased. And that happened the fear of God going throughout Canaan, that Joshua is coming and the people of God. This is the people that God delivered from Egypt. Did you hear about Egypt? I know about Egypt. They're coming! And fear gripped them. That's what brought Rahab to follow the one true God in Jericho. Deuteronomy 11.25, remember the promise of God to his people through Moses. Verse 25, no man shall be able to stand against you. Yeah, but Lord, what about Haman? Um, let me read that again. No man shall be able to stand against you. Oh, uh, King Ahasuerus. Uh, let me read that again. No man shall be able to stand against you. Well, that was just true 2,500 years ago, Pastor. You don't know where I work. Come on, people. You know, my neighbor, they're really intimidating. Come on. What kind of faith do we have? What kind of God do we serve? He's the king above all kings. No man shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will put the dread of you and the fear of you upon all the land where you tread, just as he has said to you. So what does Jesus say? Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. How will people see that there's something different about us if we complain like everybody else complains when we get sick. If we gripe about the political environment like everybody else gripes about the political environment. What's different about us, beloved? When that person that just drives you nuts 
and you pray for them and you show kindness to them and you serve them where you work, where you live, whatever it may be. And they say, what's different about you? I don't get you. It's God working in us and through us to be a blessing to our community. That's what we've been talking about in our home Bible fellowships. How are we going to be a blessing to this community and to the world? So to summarize, a good leader promotes righteous people. What is a wicked leader? What does a wicked leader do? They promote villains. They promote people who evade taxes, who lie and lie and get away with it and lie some more. And wicked leadership doesn't do a thing about it because they're in their political party. Whatever party that may be, it happens on all sides. Listen to righteous counsel. That's what a good leader does. Well, what does a wicked leader do? They don't listen. They know better than everybody. They're not humble. They reject righteous counsel. A righteous leader uses his or her power to protect the innocent and vulnerable. Well, what does a wicked leader do? They use their power and position to take. To take from people. The innocent and vulnerable. A righteous leader encourages everyone to protect the innocent and vulnerable. What does a wicked leader do? They vilify the righteous. They silence anyone who would speak against abortion. Anyone who would speak against laws that lead to righteousness, to honoring authorities, respecting elders, A righteous leader publicly honors faithfulness and integrity. A wicked leader, they honor deception. They don't honor faithfulness and integrity. A righteous leader secures an environment that protects the freedom of religion. And a wicked leader silences it. So just keep your thoughts to yourself. Everybody else can speak their thoughts. But you're a valedictorian, you want to say something about Jesus? Shut your mouth. Nobody wants to hear it. Biblically, that's a wicked leader. All in the name of, isn't this a conundrum? Tolerance? Tolerance? And our universities are just absolutely shut down from discussion. Our kids, some of you kids will be in universities, and you know what it's like to be silenced and diminished and denigrated if you hold to the truth. You're a fool. People in God in Persia, they're seeing God come to their aid and deliver them. Now think about this. God rescued Isaac from the knife of Abraham on Mount Moriah. God rescued the children of Israel from the hand of Pharaoh in Egypt. God delivered his people from the wicked plot of Haman in Persia. But no rescue came for the Son of God, the King of Kings on the cross. No rescue came for him. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The answer, because of your sin and my sin. And no rescue came for him. He died so that we could be forgiven. He died as a substitute. He laid down his life. No one takes my life from me, he said. I lay it down. And... I will take it up again. And he did. And he, through his death, burial, and resurrection, he provides true deliverance, true rescue. It looked like Satan had the upper hand until that first Easter came. He was done. And Paul says, because he lives, we too shall live. As the men come to prepare for communion, we remember the body that was broken. We remember the blood that was shed. But we do so with a perspective of victory. We don't remember Jesus as being crucified and still being crucified. He is alive. 
He conquered death, hell, and the grave so that we could be forgiven and adopted into his family. We could be reconciled. And he's coming again. So as we engage in this communion, we think about how wicked King Ahasuerus was and how great King Jesus is and what he did for us and what he has done for you if you have never trusted in him. Communion is for those who have been saved. For those who have followed Christ in baptism, first step of obedience, and for those who are, you're not living in sin. If you're living in sin, the table is the place for you to go get right. Do what's right. Go, go ask someone to forgive you. If you're living in sin, get, get out of sin. Don't partake of the Lord's table and be living in rebellion. Don't do it. The Bible says it's drink, eating and drinking damnation to yourself. And as we remember Jesus, let our minds go to Revelation 19.1. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. That's what they were able to say in Persia. And by God's grace, that's what we can say today. Salvation and honor and glory and dominion and power belong to the Lord our God. And he gives it. All who are weary, come to me, and I will give you rest. I have it to give to you. You can't earn it, and you can't get it on your own, but he offers it to you today because he paid your fine. He died my death. Father, we love you because you first loved us and you sent Christ as Savior. As we remember your body that was broken, as we remember your blood that was shed, we thank you, and we rejoice that you're alive, you intercede for us, you reign and you will one day return and we wait for your return and we are devoting our lives afresh and anew this morning so that all peoples everywhere will hear this good news that they don't have to die in their sin, that you have made a way. We thank you, we bless your name and we pray for those even in our in their congregation this morning that don't know you, that they would humble themselves before you and trust in Christ alone and that you would save them. Do that work today for your great name. Amen.